Right, we're back here at Hawaii Real, everybody, and I have a very special episode today. It's a little bit rushed midweek, but I think it was definitely something that needed to be done and needed to happen in a expeditionary fashion, if that's a word I can use. So I wanted to bring on two of Honolulu's bravest from the Honolulu Fire Department that have been making a little bit of waves in this recent week with uh, mandated vaccinations that are going around where they're you'll have to lose your job if you don't get vaccinated. Whether you agree with it or not, I wanted to bring them on because I wanted them to have a voice and have a story and put a, put together a platform where they can voice that opinion in a long form content. So here we go. All right, so I have on today, Kaimi Pelikai, captain of- uh, Kalihi Uka Fire Kalihi Station. Kalihi Uka Fire Station mm-hmm. with Honolulu Fire Department. Yes. And Ikaika Shilling. Yep. Aloha gang, uh, engine 43. Second watch, so that's East Kapolei. East Kapolei. Kapole. Okay, thank you, brothers, so much for coming on this show. And I know it's been a hectic week, and I know it's been just pile upon pile of phone calls, emails. You guys getting called to, you know, do this, do that. You, Amy, you've been on the news a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Social media is blowing up, even though you don't have social media. So no, you clue. know what's going on. No clue. But I want to tell you, your face is out there, your voice is out there, and I want to yeah. help uh, expedite that okay. with okay. this with this platform. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to get to first was. An introduction. Yeah. Who are you? We've seen your plight, yes. but we want to know who is Kaimi Palakai. Well, thank you uh, for asking. So, I was uh, born and raised in Nanakuli, Oahu. I went to Nanakuli Elementary School. My parents are Henry and Lurleen Palakai. Um, my father was a firefighter for 37 years, also an entrepreneur. Uh, he owned a number of different ventures, probably his. He started the first surfboard shop in Waianae back in the 60s because that's what he did growing up, surfing. And then he went into commercial fishing. My dad, he, you know, he, he went graduated from Waianae High School, but he was no scholar. He went to Vietnam like a lot of people. Uh, but when he came home, he had ambition. We had a commercial fishing business. So I grew up fishing with my dad. He flew the airplane. We worked on the boat. We, we caught around Akule. Uh, and then I got into Kamehameha schools in seventh grade. Where we know we all went to school. Everybody around here, we all got classmates. So so much fun seeing everybody doing some great things out there. Graduated in '96, um, and I got into the fire department in 2001. Been a fireman for 20 years now. Worked my way through the ranks. I was stationed in Y and I nine years. Then I went to Station 14, Wailua. Got promoted. Came back to Nanakuli. I drove the engine in Nanakuli, and then I drove on a tanker. So I grew up at the fire station where in Nanakuli. My dad was stationed there for 20 years. I grew up at playing at the station, you know, basically living at the fire station and I ended up back there. So being a fireman's in your blood. You could say that. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, yeah, pretty much is in my blood. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to tell a joke, but maybe, they, okay, I'll tell my joke. Uh, in the fire department, in the old days, all the kids of the fire firemen used to come to the station, and I, I jokingly say I had my first kiss in the fire station with one of the other firemen's daughters. Oh. But we were little kids, you know. Oh, I thought we were gonna kids. stop there with one of the other firemen. Yeah, no, like, oh, yeah, yeah, hey, no. we're not hey, That didn't happen until I was an adult. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, you know, so I, fire firefighting, being around the fire station is definitely in my blood. So I was stationed there as a driver for five years, and then I got promoted to captain, and now I'm in Kalihi. So that's the story. Married family? Uh, yep. My, uh, yes, my wife, and we have a little dog, and that's our family. Nice. Mm-hmm. nice. And yet we were high school classmates from Kamehameha. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, and this is the first time we've seen each other since 20 graduation. years. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe more. It's a great reunion. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when I saw, saw Tony Kalahui on here that day, I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about the timing of me coming on, but yeah, that's cool. How do you work? Yeah, it's exactly. good. Though. It's exactly. good to see you. Thank you very much sir, for having me. Ikaika, all right. What's your, what's your story? Are you from Hawaii? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you from? Born and raised in Kalu, but like so many other families here, our family, you know, want a bigger, better thing. So, high school time ended up having to move to the mainland. My father got a job transfer. So my, my parents, Charmaine Schilling and William Schilling, they both castle, castle kids, all both Kaniwai, born and raised, and um, so we ended up moving to Seattle. No, I couldn't afford the home, you know, everybody's life story here pretty much. So spent spent about eight years up there, did the whole play sports, play college, play sports a little while, then into the workforce, then 9-11 happened, and a bunch of us, we were all working at the airport at the time, a bunch of us get laid off, and I thought, you know what, shine this, I'm going home. Move back home, cousins, one of my cousins gets into the fire department, I said, oh, 
bro. Yeah, I think I like to do that. Starts telling me about it. Hey, how you can do this? How you can do that? Take the test. Did okay. Get the call for the interview. Oh, all right. Here we go, boys. <laughs> so comes in, he helps me out, right? He's like, hey, I'm going to help you get ready for your interview. Make sure you're all set. As, that, as that's going by, I didn't want to just wait. So went back to school to get my EMT certs and all that. Just so I can, hey, start helping the community early. I don't want to wait around. Let's, let's, let's start going now. Worked with EMS for a year and a half. And then got the call for HFD, got hired. Started out here in, um, in Kaka'ako at Station 9. And I moved out to Station 10 for a little while. You know, as we're recruits, we get moved around mm -hmm. kind of a lot when we're early in the career. And I got lucky, I got to Station 36 and moved down to Engine 43 out in Kapolei. For now, I'm out there and... Awesome. Yeah. I so just I want to add though, my, uh, Mom, I love you too. I know I talk about Dad a lot, but Mom, I love you. And my wife's name is Christy, and I love her too. Yeah, that's all I have to add. <laughs> yeah, you need you need family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you need speaking. family support, especially in in these service industries where mm -hmm. I say service industry, law enforcement, uh, fire, EMT. You know, working in these public service first responder type industries, people have to realize that we sacrifice so much on a day to day basis. Like when there's danger, when there's a fire, you guys are running towards it. Everybody else is running away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you gonna do with a garden hose? You know, <laughs> but then, and they think, you know, I've seen people try to run into fires or burning houses and stuff like that. And they hit that smoke, that first smoke, and they start coughing, 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 and they run, but they run back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You guys just go through it. I mean, you have the gear, the equipment, but it's also, it's more than that. It's the courage, the bravery, the teamwork, mm -hmm. the family that goes into all of that to, to push you guys forward and, and allow you guys to do that. And that just that doesn't just come naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, that not everybody has that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very spe and the same thing with law enforcement. It's a very specialized professions where you we're not easily replaceable. Right. You know, I know with the police department, we're short handed. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys. Are you guys oh, yeah. like short handed? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Is, is recruitment really hard these days? Oh, uh, it's not hard, but you just have uh I, how do I put that? You know, the, the people who stay on or so, the people who come in, sometimes it's, it's not for them and they find out that they want to do something else. And you, so you got some attrition there and you have a lot of people retiring. It's, it's just what it is. It's just normal the way things work. What, I do you, what do you love about your job? Oh, uh, well, there's the camaraderie and all that stuff, but help, helping, you know, making a difference when people are in need, showing up and fixing their problems in, in as much as we can. That's the thing about firemen. There's a joke, right? We're jock, the jocks of all trades, as they say, because you kind of got to know how to fix this. And then maybe there's that problem, you know, because that's what we do. When there's a problem, we come in and we fix it. So cats in the trees. You got to go get them. Yeah, yeah. Never I've, find I've dead had cats. some pretty ridiculous ones, though. <laughs> Cat in a tree, mate. I've had a duck in the water. A duck in the water. Yeah. You got what? called to a duck in yeah. the water. Oh, Cap. When, when we were in Mililani, a duck in distress. We pull up, duck just swimming in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and Auntie's on the side of the road. No, it's it's in distress. I, I can feel its pain. Oh. Yes. So I've been, I've been called to too much water after a flooding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's flooding from the neighbor's house into my house. It's like, it's been raining for 40 yeah, days, yeah, but yeah, what, yeah. what do you want me to do? Yeah. What do you want a cop to do for that? Sorry, but I'm not the, Moses. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you show up, you give good customer service, yep. you do your best to talk the person down and try to understand their position and then let them know, you know, maybe there's not really an emergency <laughs> with yeah. a duck floating in the water. But that's okay. We showed up, we yep. were there. We were there. You call, we come. <laughs> that's the idea. Awesome. Okay, so bring you guys on the podcast. Uh, the purpose of that was to really discuss and get into detail your guys' side of the vaccination mandate that is going on with the city and county of Honolulu. Mm -hmm. so what what was uh, your take on that, and how has it impacted your life? Well, it's been an interesting ten days, I think, since all of this has come down. So, I believe the governor made his proclamation on August fifth. And basically it was saying you have to get vaccinated or you have to test. For the most part, all the other counties in the state of Hawaii interpreted his mandate as a testing mandate where those counties are giving their employees the, the ability to choose taking the vaccine or to put it more correctly, taking this experimental drug because it's not really a vaccine. It was it was came to light under an emergency youth authorization. So you, if you read the paperwork that comes out when you take the shot, it's clear that it's not a quote unquote vaccine. It's an emergency use experimental drug. 
So the other islands, the neighbor islands, are all interpreting the governor's mandate as a testing mandate. So they're allowing their employees to literally just check a box. Either you're vaccinated or you're going to get vaccinated or you don't want to get vaccinated, you're going to test. And that's it. That's all the, the county of Hawaii, Kauai, Maui. That's all they got to do. Just check a box. Now, there's some problems with the testing, you know, but we can talk about that later. The real issue is that Mayor Blangiardi took the governor's mandate and twisted it to become this vaccine mandate, this experimental drug mandate, where the city and county workers in Honolulu, they don't have the ability to just check a box. They have to go through this religious proctal exam and prove to the governor that they are... Or the mayor. I'm sorry, exactly. Prove to the mayor that they have, I don't know, the correct religious position to choose to test. So if they <clears throat> want to not take the experimental drug, their only options are to apply for a religious ex exemption or a medical exemption. And if either of those are approved, then they can test. Very different. So there's an approval process for the testing, whereas the Outer Islands is just checking the box. And I think the public doesn't know that. They think the city and county workers just get to check a box like the neighbor island guys. But it's absolutely not true. L listen to what I'm about to tell you. Because it's not going to stop with us. If you look at a press conference the mayor just gave, he's expecting to put what he's doing to us right onto you. And so we're not just fighting for the employees. He said he's going to make it mandatory for the public as well with these passport things where if you want to go into the bar, you got to have a passport. You want to go into the movies, you got to have a vaccine passport. You can't go anywhere without it. So it's not just going to stay here. I, and I can't tell you why he's on this tirade of wanting to stick people with needles, but he, it's obvious that that's what he wants. So at the end of the day, review, the neighbor islands can just check a box and choose testing over getting stuck with the experimental drug. Honolulu, you got to pray to Mayor Blangiardi and beg him to, to see your innermost religious beliefs as worthy of choosing testing. I mean, Ikaika, would you say that that's accurate? That, that's absolutely accurate. And don't get it wrong, we're happy for our brothers and sisters on the outer islands. Awesome for you guys. But like how Cap was saying, our next is on the line right now, but it's gonna roll down to everybody else. And I'm a father of four, and I've already seen it rolling down on my kids. My daughter, she's an athlete. She's going into her junior year. Junior year is huge. A lot of recruitment happens junior year. I don't want her to get that vaccine or quote unquote vaccine, that experimental drug. I don't know what it's gonna do to her. How can I look at her and tell her, I'm not gonna allow you to take this, knowing that she's invested so much into accomplishing her goal of playing in college. I'm willing to say, no, you cannot take that. And I'm gonna turn around and take it? Absolutely not. You have to have convictions and stand behind them. And so you see, like, that's, that's the multitude of different positions that exist out there. Like, you know, for some people, it's just their religious belief. But for Ikaika, it's because of safety and it, in, in, in the experimental drug, what it's going to do to his daughter and his own conviction. If he doesn't want it for his child, he feels like he can't take it either. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, so he has so many reasons not to take the experimental drug that Mayor, Mayor Blangiati should just allow us to pick not to take it, right? Like, why do we need to prove to him we have the right religious beliefs to be able to bow out when everybody on the neighbor islands just, can just go, nah, I don't like. So that's how we got here. I, I, and I mean, I don't mean to put words into your mouth, but that's what I hear you saying. Uh, absolutely. And it's not just because of, you know, teaching lessons to my kids. That's deeply how I feel. Right. I was given the ability through my creator an immune system that can protect myself. Okay. I trust in that. I don't need somebody else telling me what I have to put into my body that I don't see fit. Because where does it stop at that point? We had the COVID-19. Now we have Delta. They got Lambda coming out there. Echo and all these. They got like 13 other ones. That they already have named. So are, are we going to have to have Absolutely mandated for boosters each for each one? <laughs> I mean, when does it stop? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And and every step of the way, if we give and we give and we give, I mean, you guys got to know that it, once you give government a little piece of power, they're not going to give them back. It's so hard to get back your freedoms once you give them up. So that's why we're here. And we want to tell the public that, you know, we're not against the vaccine or those who want to take it. We just want the freedom to choose our own journey in life. That's it. And we don't want to have to beg the mayor for that choice because we don't feel it's right. So from what I read in our policies, when you fill out your exemption, you confess your religious belief, you sign your name to the paper, and then it goes to a three panel committee at Frank Fossey building or whatever it's called nowadays, HMB, whatever, Honolulu Municipal Building. And in this b building, there's a room somewhere with thousands of people's religious understanding of their relationship between them and their God. And three, whoever they are, I have no idea. People will open these paper up, papers up and make judgments on you. Just listen to that. You just confessed the most private, intimate beliefs any person could ever have. And you have these people you don't know, don't know you, just sit there and, and, and judge you by what you wrote. And in judging you, they can force you to take something you don't want. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and to add insult to injury, the form we have to fill out, there's a little blurb in there that just blows my mind. So here we are asking for this exemption. In good faith, we are, right? We sign the paper in good faith. We come to our employer because that's what he wants us to do. However, in and on the paper, there's this little blurb on the paper. Now, this is the paper that we sign attesting to our religious belief that the person reads. And this is what the mayor says. I understand. And this is me attesting, right? So as I read this, the I is me saying, I understand. And I sign my name to this. I understand that the city is not required to provide the above requested exemption as an accommodation if doing so would pose a direct threat to myself or others in the workplace or would create an undue hardship for my department, agency, and or the city and county of Honolulu. Unbelievable. I, so obviously it takes a little while to digest that statement. You play the thing back, listen to it over and over again, and you'll come to understand what the mayor just said is, yeah, you can tell me your relationship between God and you about this. But if I feel like you're a danger to yourself, the city, or you're going to cost too much money to keep you unvaccinated, give me the paper, I'll throw them away, and I'm going to give you the vaccine anyway. What is or this? Or you're terminated. Or, yeah, or you're fired. Right. I mean, I thought we lived in America, brother. Well, and, and all this is all good because I said emergency. Everything, all of your rights, everything previously is wiped out, no more nothing emergency do what i said and that's already proven to be wrong you cannot take people's constitutional rights away just because of an emergency what are we china what are we russia what is this if freedom isn't if the constitution doesn't exist and, and is supreme to anything at all times then where are we living so anyway that's the what that's what's going on right now and i hope the people of honolulu can understand that Okay, so we heard about the, what the problems are with this and what you guys' opinions are on that. And, you know, from my point of view, not even going to play devil's advocate, but there is a double-edged sword here. You know, I've been vaccinated, and so I do support people that are vaccinated, and I support the people that choose not to get vaccinated. However, I wanted to hear what your guys' um, solutions are, what your opinions are of how we should move forward with this going forward, because there is the pandemic, there is there are people afraid, and, you know, there are politicians and people in government that need to make some kind of decisions, mm -hmm. whether it be right or wrong, what, what we know, mm -hmm. um, but they have to make some kind of decisions. So mm -hmm. from your guys' point of view, what do you think should be done from here on out? Well, if the cons real, real concern is public safety, right? The real concern is public safety, then vaccination of the first responders is not the answer because we've already seen that a vaccine person can get the virus and he can or she can still spread it. So that's not necessarily the solution because you can still have a vaccine person get it and spread it. And what's really crazy, the majority of people in the fire department who have gotten COVID since the vaccination came out were the vaccinated ones. 
So it's not the unvaccinated people in the fire department that are catching and or spreading COVID. It's literally the vaccinated one. You know why? Because there's a narrative out there that if you're vaccine, you can do whatever you like. And it's true because you fly in and out of the state, you're vaccinated. You don't even have to test. Even though the CDC has already come out and said vaccinated people still can catch and give the virus away. But everybody's treating it like there's some holy group of people that can't spread Corona. And that's why you're seeing in the fire department, all the recent COVID cases were from people who went Las Vegas. People who went Las Vegas came back to work and gave the people at work COVID. And all those guys at the station vaccinated. Now, I mean, this is rumors. We only hear through the grapevine. What needs to happen is the administration needs to come out with the data. And I'm going to bet less than 1% of the people in the fire department in total, 1% have caught COVID from a patient, from our job, from doing what we do. Less than 1% now. So we got 1,100 firefighters. That means less than 11 have caught, and I think it's, I think it's half of 1%. Because I've been working in Kalihiuka since December. Red, 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 red. We got a lot of immigrant community, Micronesians, a lot of um, Samoan, you know, like people who travel a lot throughout the Pacific. Uh, they need health care. Their uh, comorbidities are there. They live in big households. Yeah, big households, all those reasons. I go to all those guys. I do CPR on all those guys. I do respiratory uh, treatments on all of them. I never got COVID this whole time. You know, because like Kazikaiko was saying, we got all the PPEs. Yeah. So, I mean, when we come into your home to help you, we are dressed to the nines. And I mean, we'll go over it right now. So I would have my turnout bottoms on. Right. Then I have a medical jacket over the medical jacket. I have another medical gown. On top of that, I got medical grade gloves. Then I have at least an N95 could be up to a respirator. I have goggles and a face shield. There's no reason for us. To it's be like afraid of the patients. Work, exactly. Then, you know, getting a vaccine is not going to help. I'm not yeah. afraid to get in there and help you. And you should not be afraid that I'm bringing something to you. I'm fully, I'm enclosed to me. We're keeping everything separate here. Universal precautions, right? That, that's what we're taught for our medicals. So what is with you stays with you. What's with me stays with me. We're here to help you and get you on your way. Packaged up. Done deal. You and, know? The, and the data should show it. That's why to for reality to just throw it out there like, oh, the first responders are a problem. They need to take the vaccine when vaccinated people can catch and give and unvaccinated people who are firefighters fully closed, going in every day, never caught COVID. Not to mention, <laughs> we have decontamination procedures after the call. So it's not like we're bringing stuff back to the station to the other guys at the station or, you know, dirty clothes taking it home. We're not taking those back home either to spread to our families. You know, we. We have safety on our mind also. It's not just we're just playing cowboy out there and just showing up and yeah, here we go, boom, boom, boom. That's not it. We have safety always at the forefront of every operation we run. So exactly. ho hopefully that kind of eases some people's mind that may maybe not yeah, have just known. just a continuance of using personal yeah. protective equipment that we've been doing on, on both uh, you yeah. know, law enforcement and yes. fire for the past what, I don't even know how long COVID's been around, but yeah, a year Actually, and a half. Actually, before that. Yeah, oh, that's normal. Yeah. It's just when COVID hit its peak, all, all the departments, or uh, EMS, us guys, they took necessary precautions to protect mm -hmm. us, and, and they went above and beyond. Like the, like Teresa says uh, on, on the other interview, UV lights, UV, they got a rig where you flip the thing on and it UV lights the whole back of the ambulance. We've been dealing with HIV, hepatitis. Yes, yes. All kinds of stuff for... Uh, yeah, and so oh, you, you guys remember swine flu and yeah. all this. Oh, that was the, the last scary, scary exactly, thing. Right. Ebola at the airport. Oh, oh, so it's not that we're not taking precautions. We are taking precautions. And Hugely. You guys think that with the precautions you guys are taking, enough. That's that's good enough because it's it's proven. It, it, it's not a speculation. Bring the data out. Let's say we went to since COVID started. Let's say we went to ten thousand COVID cases. 10,000 COVID cases, how many personnel caught COVID from the 10,000 COVID cases? I would bet it's less than 10, maybe five, maybe even less than that. Because you know, the truth is, I think I heard a, a rumor today that out there in the public that a firefighter went to a COVID call. Oh my gosh, and nobody reported it. Because we don't, we go to COVID calls every day. We do CPR right. and COVID people every day. The only time we report an exposure is if the COVID patient coughs on us without our gear on that's it so that's the only time 
And guess what? We don't report exposures. Why? Because we always have our gear on. The only time it happened is when they were carrying a COVID patient downstairs in this carry seat. And the, the carry got tricky and the guy's glasses got smashed off his face. But he's carrying the patient with mm. two hands. So he can't drop his patient to fix his glasses. And as his glasses went down, she coughed in his face. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't confirm or deny whether they got COVID or not. But most of the time, it doesn't happen. That's just a unique scenario. They're going downstairs. It's really tight. It drops off of his face and she coughs at him. So, yeah, it, it, to say that we are the problem is completely, it's just not true. He's not looking at the facts. He's not doing proper analysis. So at the end of the day, you know, how do we get move out of this? Because you asked, right? So we presented to you the data. There is no problem with first responders. We are not catching. We are not spreading COVID. So to come out and say, if you're a first responder and you're unvaxxed, you need to get vac vaccinated to save the plug from COVID is completely false. Well, it's not even first responders now. It's all city workers. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so well, that's even not, that's, that's even not. more crazy. Well, yeah. You're Absolutely. a secretary at the uh, Ar Lion Arboretum and you got to get one vaccine. What? What are your chances of coming across? You work outdoors every day at Lion Arboretum doing weed wacky. Why you got to take on COVID vaccine? You're never going to. Like you outdoors, we already say it's outdoors. So it's insane. It's really nuts when you think about it. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. So I, I guess if there's anything, if you had to do anything, it would be test everybody. You know what I mean? Like if you had to pick, if you wanted a public health safety uh, technique to try and take care of this, it would probably be to test everybody. But even that's not necessary because we, we already do on self-check when we come work. Because well, <laughs> even during the height of the pandemic, you guys were, you guys had testing facilities going around or testing people yeah. going around to your stations. Absolutely. And we, we could think about it this way also. Okay, no problem with people that want to get the vaccine. Great. Do what you have to do, what you think is right. But as we've shown, the people with the vaccine can carry a higher viral load without showing any sign or symptom. Okay, so... They could be walking all over work and nobody's even thinking that they're sick at all, okay? Whereas maybe somebody that's not vaccinated, they might have a smaller viral load and be showing symptoms. So who's more likely to be a super spreader, so to speak, right? The guy that is not vaccinated, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling too good. Hmm, maybe I better check, stay home. Or the guy that doesn't feel anything at all because I'm vaxxed, I can handle a higher viral load without the side effects and just go about my daily, work. daily routine. And that's what happened recently. A uh, vaccinated guy felt great, no problem, came to work and he was positive. But what their paperwork shows is that they only want the unvaccinated to be forced to test. Well, now, is that test, safe? The CDC came out that the test doesn't necessarily differentiate between the flu. Absolutely. And they never COVID. they never solidified the right. SARS-CoV-2. They came out with that on July 21st. Yeah. Yeah. It's on their website. So this is, see, and we don't want to get into the minutia here right. because you can have people come with all kinds of statistics and all kinds of facts and talk about all kinds of things. At the end of the day, I guess the best thing to say is we're unsure. We're unsure. It's uncertain. The best thing when that happens is freedom. When we're unsure, let people choose for themselves because that's their personal decision. Once the government tries to tell people what to do, we get into danger. So I guess if you had to get it down to anything, we should test everybody make it equal because vaccine vaccinated people can catch and spread unvaccinated can catch and spread so test everybody and then you monitor yourself like we already do if you're feeling unwell stay at home uh, we already come to work there's a check sheet we got to ask we got to take our temperature all of that's in place already so we're good we don't need any more mm -hmm. and the data shows it all right guys i want to thank you so much for coming on this show and and sharing um i hope the best for you guys you know, you guys have my support. I think you have a support of a lot of people that aren't coming out necessarily being vocal about it Absolutely. just yet. Oh, thank you, brother. Good to see you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Stay happy, Hawaii. Aloha.